Agradecemos a las autoridades. Comenzamos ahora con el primer keynote del evento que expondrá acerca de algunos pronósticos sobre IPv4, IPv6 y su jefe. We would like to welcome Lee Howard, the CEO of Retivia. Retivia provides IPv6 as a service. He will give some predictions about IPv4, IPv6, and how to convince your boss to let you work upon IPv6, among other topics. Go ahead, Lee. Thank you very much. Uh, good. My name is Lee Howard. Um, I work for Retivia. My company does uh, trans translation IPv6 to IPv4. Uh, I do a lot of talking to people around the world about uh, their transitions to IPv6, what their plans are. And I'm finding more and more that engineers are telling me, we want to deploy IPv6, but I just can't convince my boss. And sometimes they'll, they'll tell me they can convince their boss, but not the executives. And so I want to talk about how to convince executives that they need to deploy or at least look into IPv6. So one thing you need to know is executives are stupid. Um, there, there's a, there's, we have this principle called the Peter Principle, that managers rise to the level of their incompetence. That means when you're good at your job, you get promoted. And if you don't get promoted, you leave and go to another company. So this is true for executives and, and probably a lot of engineers. Uh, and that's why nobody knows how to do their job very well. Because if they did, they'd get bored and move on. When you keep that in mind, you, th you can think a little bit more about the ambition that executives have. So here's my goal. I want to help you build a business case. Hopefully, and you can do this very quickly, even though I'm going to take a long time, to convince your management not to work on IPv6 necessarily. I can't get you all the way there. But at least convince your management to do a full, to, to allow a full assessment of how soon you need to do IPv6 and how long it's going to take. And then they can make a business decision on whether they should uh, do IPv6, on, on when they should start deploying IPv6. So uh, I have a secondary goal, which was to provide a lot of data in one place so that you can download these slides and just pull the slides that you want and use them in your own presentation. I've given the URLs for all of my sources so that you can go uh, recreate them yourself. And I want to, because I want to let you have the ability to make your own argument to your, to your executive management. So here's the thing to understand about executives. They help, uh, operate from two places. They are, operate out of fear and out of greed. So they fear making some terrible mistake. This keeps them awake at night. They lose sleep that they're going to miss something important and the business is going to fail or they're going to get fired or something's going to go wrong in their division and, and it's going to ruin their careers. They also fear missing an opportunity that will let them reach the next level. They want to, your vice president wants to be an executive vice president. Your executive vice president wants to be CIO or CTO or CEO. They all want the next thing. Or sometimes what they're really looking for is a much shorter term. All they want is to get their bonus at the end of the quarter. So fear and greed, we're going to bear that in mind as we move on. So, you are probably motivated by three things, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. I stole this from this book. You like to know that you have control over how you do your job. You want to know that you're getting better at something. You as an engineer, you like to learn new things. You like to work on cool new technology. Um, and you like to know that what the work that you're doing matters, that it makes a difference in at least your company. And I think to the world, we work on the internet, we bring, and many, most of us bring the internet to people who may never have had it before, and that's a spectacular thing to work on. We live for this. Executives uh, work a little bit, are motivated a little bit differently. Here's that fear and greed. They're risk averse, they're, wor they're worried about competition, they want to reduce costs, that's their greed, is they get bonuses if they reduce costs, and uh, they like to look for new capabilities and new revenues. Those last two things, are the kinds of things they can put on their resumes when they go for the next job or the next promotion. So let me start walking through those. The first motivation is risk. Um, uh, there's two, two major, it's not, you can think of these as internal risks and external risks. The first one is that you might run out of IPv4 addresses. And the second one is that there's a risk of something being IPv6 only before you have IPv6. I'm going to go into these, don't worry. And then, of course, the second, the external ones are, are the competition that uh, they may uh, work faster than you or, uh, or, or that 
there just may be, may be more IPv6, you may be late in your country. All right, so you'd probably need to do an analysis, and I can't do this analysis for you. I've been trying to think about how I could do it for you. You need to figure out when you're going to run out of IPv4 addresses. And it may be in two years, and it may be in 10 years, and it may be in 30 years, and I've seen all of those as I've talked to people and, and done what analysis I can do. But what you have to think, what you need to be able to say is, in five years or 10 years, we're going to run out of IPv4 addresses, and when we do, we only have three options. We can deploy carrier-grade NAT, we can buy IPv4 addresses, or we can do IPv6 plus v4 as a service, translation. Now, if this doesn't apply to you, if this particular motivator is so far in the future that it's not gonna drive any work, leave it out. This shouldn't be part of your argument. Uh, the important thing when you're doing the uh, buying IPv4 addresses is to be able to say uh, that what they're, going to, what they're going to cost, how many addresses you will need to buy for to fulfill a need for how long and what they'll cost. So this is new data. Uh, nobody's seen this before. This is uh, used from our good friends at IPv4Auctions.com. Uh, I've plotted on the y-axis uh, uh, a price per address, and the x-axis is just uh, over time. Each color series is, and of course you can download these slides from the agenda, um, each series is uh, on that date there was a transaction for, for that prefix length. So the, the blue squares are sort of down here at the bottom, there's a few of those. That's a slash 18. These green squares are slash 24, and then every prefix length in between. And we see a couple of things from this. And I was trying to figure out, is there a way we can predict pricing over time? So we're looking for trends. We can see that early in the market, nobody knew what IPv4 addresses should cost. The prices are all over the place. Gradually, prices settled in somewhere around seven to $10. And we can also see this sort of this, this uh, difference in price, where we have uh, down at the low end for the larger blocks, you're paying less per address, and the higher, the smaller blocks, you're pay paying more per, at per address. It was sort of a bulk discount. That seems, though, to have changed over time. You can see that this is starting to converge, and the price for uh, slash 20s is right, is clustered right around the same price as slash 24s. Now. This is for still fairly small blocks, and address brokers in the room may have their own data. I would love it if you would send me your pricing data so that I can include that here and add that, because I think that higher, that larger blocks may, prices may differ. But this is the only public information there is, so that's what I'm using. There's something else that I see, which is just in the last couple of months, we've had some of these slash 24s come up really expensive, really high. We've got a transaction here for about $23 and a couple at $20. Uh, $19 for, uh, for a slash per address for a slash 24. I don't know if that's an anomaly and it's going to go away. That seems to have happened a few years ago. There was some, some scatter there and then prices did rise. Or I don't know if this is showing that there is a new price being set for, for IPv4 addresses. Uh, so I drew a trend line because I wanted to see, well, okay, if this continues, what's the price going to be? And, if we, uh, and I used a fourth order polynomial Okay, math. Uh, a higher order polynomial uses higher exponents. Um, sorry to the translators. Um, these higher order exponents, uh, a higher order polynomial will put more emphasis on uh, more recent data. So a fourth order polynomial shows that this curve, the prediction for the rest of the year, is that prices will get pretty high. Um, if it follows this curve, we're getting close to $30 per address. And I saw that and I went, $30 per address, I've seen that number someplace before. Wait a minute, I was in Cancun for LACNIC uh, four years ago, and I talked about uh, when you should buy addresses and when you should deploy carrier-grade NAT and IPv6 and when you should sell addresses. And using the assumptions that I had, I said $30 is about where buying addresses doesn't make sense anymore. Now, I'm not saying that's true for you. You have to do your own analysis, and you can go back and look at that presentation. And, and, and there's a spreadsheet there, and you can plug in your own costs and assumptions and figure out where it makes sense. But um, things might start to change. Now, if you don't believe that the recent past is a predictor of the, the rest of the year, you can just do a straight line extrapolation. Still looks like we'll hit about $20 per address by the end of the year, right, if those trends continue. Something like that. So the next thing I wanted to do was I, thinking about this $30 number as prices rise, do people buy fewer addresses when, they, when prices are higher? So I plotted the price per address again. 
times the number of addresses that have been bought at that price. So at $7 uh, per address, only about 35,000 addresses changed hands, which may mean that you know, that, uh, that was too early and, and uh, the sellers gave up on $7 and quickly hiked the price. And there's a couple of transactions out here on the right that are uh, up near uh, 250,000 addresses at those prices, but those were actually just two transactions. So I'm not sure that those are useful, but we'll keep them in. Because what I really want to see is, is it the case that fewer addresses get bought when prices get higher? And it does seem to be the case. Uh, it's not a strong correlation. I, w I don't really want to emphasize it too much. And, and all of these, uh, these very high prices, that may simply be, you know, with, with very few addresses being transferred, that may simply be that those prices are just too recent and we haven't had time to see a full uh, market develop for those. So that may still move out to the right. But I thought that was interesting and that says, well, so supply and demand does seem to be uh, take, having some effect here. I'm not sure how strong an effect, but there's something to it. All right, so let's talk about uh, the, the rest of risk is that there's a risk that, that something that you want, something you need, will require IPv6 before you're ready to have, before you have IPv6. So think about a couple of years from now, there's some website that you want to get to, some traffic monitoring tool, some kind of something that you want or need that requires the use of IPv6 to, to use it. Um, or that there's something that your customers want that requires IPv6. Or maybe, maybe even not requires IPv6, but is cheaper over IPv6. Now you're probably saying, oh no, nobody's gonna deploy anything that's IPv6 only, that's way into the future. And I'm gonna say, well, let's look at the future. So I'm starting with the United States because I know it well. And this is uh, Eric Vinke providing data from Google Statistics on, um, okay, I'm gonna try to slow down. Uh, this is uh, Google Statistics. Uh, daily statistics for this country, and that, that's the blue line, and you can see uh, the amount of IPv6 is increasing over time. Uh, we see every year at New Year, we see a spike, and then uh, deployment flattens out for the year, and then around the middle of the year, it increases again. So if this trend continues, we would expect to see 50% of people in the United States having IPv6 this year. We are less than a year away from half of the US having IPv6. We are, 80% is way out here on the right. 2020, in the year 2020, 80% of the US will have IPv6. You start to think maybe IPv6 only isn't that far away. Okay, but that's the United States. Let's look at a few other countries. This is Bolivia. Uh, Bolivia has some IPv6 deployment, uh, somewhere around five or six uh, percent, so and and increasing. That's good. And so, if that trend continues, uh, they'll have 50 percent of Bolivia will have IPv6 in about 2023. That sounds like a long way away, but it's only five years. It's we're starting to think this may be realistic. Uh, this one's Brazil. Uh, Brazil has. Uh, let's, let's stop and talk about this curve for a minute. This is an S-curve. New technologies tend to get adopted along an S-curve. So it's very slow at the beginning, and then adoption speeds up, and then you get to the hard stuff, and it slows down again. That's not really what we're seeing here in Brazil. Uh, this looks like a few organizations deployed IPv6, and then just as new users came in, as new equipment was brought in, uh, there, there were more, uh, uh, the, the growth just occurred naturally. So, so maybe let's just do a linear, just a straight line extrapolation, and Brazil would have 50% in three years, 2021. That's, that's pretty soon, uh, especially if you think about, I don't know if, how many people have done their assessment, but I've never seen anybody deploy IPv6, I've never seen an ISP deploy IPv6 in less than five years. So th th it starts to look pretty, pretty more urgent depending on, on where you are. Uh, Ecuador, we see 50% uh, 2020, two years, 80% uh, in 
2022, although that may be more of a, a straight line until more people deploy. Uh, Guatemala, uh, fairly low deployment right now, but good job, very fast last year, and then growth to 20% in a couple of years. Mexico, uh, again, uh, slow deployment, but a nice curve. That we'll, we'll see how far this goes. We see, according to this, 50% in 2020, 80% 2021, if it goes that fast. Peru, 50% in 2020. Uruguay, okay, probably not. That's, that, that curve is a little too steep. I don't think we're going to go from zero to 90% in one year. That's too much to expect. But, but good deployment uh, there, nearly 30%. This is the important one. This is the world. So, and again, this is Google's data. And Google, and you can see it looks, it's, it's a squiggly line. Uh, I'm sorry, translator, squiggly? I don't know. Um, during the weekend, when everybody is at home, they use IPv, the, the number is high. During the week when people are at work, the number is low because businesses haven't deployed IPv6 yet. If you look at the S-curve over time, we see that worldwide we can expect IPv6 deployment to hit 50% in about the end of 2019. That's next year. Half the world is going to be using IPv6. 80% in 2022. 80% of the world using IPv6 in just four years. If you've been thinking that IPv6 is a long way off, you may want to think that one through again. And remember the point to make to your boss here is, um, we're trying to examine the risk that there will be something that uses or requires IPv6 or is cheaper on IPv6 uh, before we're ready for IPv6. And when you look at this, you do start to think that might be realistic in the next four, five, six years. This is a listing um, from AP NIC. This is the United States. Uh, I, li I listed the, biz the autonomous systems, the ASs, uh, in the US, sorted by uh, what percentage of their connections use IPv6. And we're up at 99%, down to 93% in the middle here. So you may not care about this top one as St. Olaf College. Probably not a lot of your users go to this small school in, in Minnesota. But the second one is Google, and you might care about Google, their office. Lower down, we see Microsoft, 97.8%. Uh, we see T-Mobile, a large uh, mobile carrier. We see uh, Verizon Wireless. In fact, it's sort of cut off down at the bottom of the slide. Um, mobile providers in the US, 75% of mobile handsets uh, are able to use IPv6 now, 75%. So if you were designing an app that for mobile users and it was gonna take you two years to roll it out, you might seriously consider rolling it out IPv6 only because, I mean, you're down to so few mobile users. That last 25% is people with phones that are five or 10 years old. They're never gonna support your app. So you're starting to think seriously, IPv6 is realistic for mobile apps and content that people are only reaching over mobile. I've got one more quick one on this. Uh, Hurricane Electric uh, has a list of autonomous systems we can see that they report that about one half of 1% of autonomous systems uh, are announcing IPv6 prefixes only. I don't know why. It's very hard to look at a list of AS numbers and look at who they are and see if they have another AS that's doing IPv4 and figure out why they're doing that for what it's worth. Let's talk about competition. So I showed the growth rate of uh, Stone. I, so, so I was showing you know, the IPv6 deployment rate in your country, that's a big deal. That's uh, something that you need to worry about. You can also go to this site at APNIC, enter your country code at the end there, and you can see the list of autonomous systems, uh, networks in your country, and click on them and see their growth rate of IPv6. Uh, you don't want to be the last one in your country to deploy IPv6. That might be a little bit embarrassing. Um, I'm about to do something that I'm a little nervous about. Uh, this is brand new. This is last night brand new. Uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted to see uh, when a network runs out of IPv4 addresses, how significant that is to the country. 
so that I could show over time a certain number of users are affected by IPv4 runout, and at, at what speed, how fast is the country running out of, or is all of your competition running out of IPv4 addresses? So what I took is I took for the number of users, I used the APNIC data, their, their samples. That seemed to me to be a close correlation to the number of users in the network. And I looked at networks that I could look up and to see how many users they have. Uh, that's not true with mobile companies and it's not true with hosting companies, but it's what I have for now. Uh, then for the growth rate, I looked at, I was trying to find any kind of, uh, anything that would show me uh, the growth of a network over time, how many users you have over time, and I, I couldn't find that, so I looked up uh, the growth rate for a country, and then I assumed that growth within a country is the same for all networks in that country. So if your country is deploying IPv6, excuse me, is deploying internet access, IPv4 even, uh, at a rate of 10% growth per year, then that's the number I used for every network in the country. Then I divided those two numbers, and I came up with when does, that, does each network run out of IPv4 addresses? And then I said, how, how many, what percent of the country's population is that network uh, that, that has just run out? And then I add those up. So, whew, Panama, here we are. Right now, about a little less than 15% of the population of Panama is in a, inside a network that has already run out of IPv4 addresses, has more users than it has IPv4 addresses. So that network is obviously using carrier grade net, right? That, that's not a surprise. Um, it's a shame that they have to, and maybe we wish, and maybe they wish they could use IPv6 uh, and only use uh, uh, NAT for uh, getting from V6 to to, to V4 destinations. And it doesn't look like it's growing very fast. We've got a few networks, a few small networks will run out of IPv4 in a few years. In about 2028, 2029, some big networks run out of IPv4 addresses. And so you would expect that when that happens, some big networks in Panama are gonna be looking for either buying addresses or deploying IPv6 or deploying carrier grade NAT. Those are their only choices. In fact, you would expect that to happen several years before that, right? Because you're not gonna wait until the day you can't turn up a new customer. Presumably, you're gonna do that ahead of time. I only have this chart for a few countries. I would like to do it for everybody else. I just haven't had time. This is Ecuador. Ecuador, right now, 20% of the population is behind a network that is already out of IPv4 addresses. And in uh, 2020, Large networks will run out, and we get to 50% of Ecuador being behind networks that don't, have, uh, that, that don't have enough IPv4 addresses. Maybe this is why we're seeing some deployment of IPv6 in Ecuador. And this number uh, does seem to be climbing over, over time, so uh, more and more networks over the years will be running out of IPv4. And then the last one I have is Bolivia. Uh, more than 80% of the population of Bolivia is behind a network that does not have enough IPv4 addresses. <clears throat> I'm guessing that Bolivia is mostly mobile, and therefore it's, uh, it, it's, everybody is behind some kind of, of NAT, but uh, as the, we've seen recent deployments a little bit in, in Bolivia. Uh, can't wait to see what they do next, and boy would I be pushing for IPv6 if I were running there, because that means that every customer is going through NAT, and you could reduce that if you had more IPv6. Smaller boxes, less capital. So, that was exciting, I can't wait to do more of that. Let me talk more about competition. The other competitive issue is latency. There are lots of studies, and I'll show them to you, that show that IPv6 is faster than IPv4. Uh, you may have seen some of these before. You need to look at where it matters to you. It may be your users, it may be your websites. Maybe you want your websites to operate faster. Uh, the important thing to say to the executive is, we have to deploy IPv6 so that we can have this speed advantage before our competitors do. If our competitors deploy, or what I'd really worry about is if my competitors have deployed IPv6, they might start advertising that they're 15% faster than we are, and that would be bad. 
so just to prove this, because nobody ever believes me when I tell them that V6 is faster, this is a quote from Akamai. Uh, they tested uh, five, it was five, IPv6 was 5% faster in the median and 15% faster at the 95th percentile. Uh, this is uh, a scholarly academic paper that showed that IPv6 was faster for about 20% of websites, of major websites. And it was, uh, for 91% of the rest, it, it was within one millisecond. So it's, there, there's no, certainly no penalty, and in fact, better. This is from LinkedIn, and they've only provided charts for, sub, for a few countries. So I've included what I, I'm sorry, none in Latin America. Uh, but this is, they're showing for certain mobile providers, and you can, can't quite see the names of the providers. Uh, we've got down here in Germany, uh, IPv6 is 22% faster for that one, 23% faster for that one, 15% uh, faster, 13% faster. And so they, can, they know that some networks are actually significantly faster than others when they deploy IPv6. This makes a big difference, especially if you have uh, a website or an application where speed matters. If you're trying to keep users looking at your page, you know that faster performance means they stay looking at your page longer. This is from uh, Facebook. Uh, this was preliminary data where they found that it was 30 to 40% faster. They looked at numbers more and decided maybe it's more like 15% faster. Uh, all right, so lots of data showing that IPv6 is faster. Uh, greed. So I talked about executives are motivated by fear and greed. Uh, the, the greed part is they want to do something that either gets them their bonus or their next promotion that they can be proud of and put on their resume to say, I, I, I deserve this promotion or I deserve a promotion at the next company. And the two major areas, one is reducing costs and the other is doing something new, uh, bringing in, especially if it's bringing in new revenue. I wouldn't push on these too hard if you're not very sure that they're true because you don't want to lie to your executives. You want to give them the best, po the best information. I often say, my job has always been to make sure that my boss makes well-informed bad decisions. At least they're well-informed. So I'm gonna talk about, yeah, I'm gonna talk about both of these. Uh, so at some point you can reduce costs by avoiding buying IPv4 addresses, right? If you don't have to pay the money to buy them, then you've avoided that cost. Uh, and you do need to look at, I've got examples down here, how much, address, how much address space would you have to buy? If you run out in three years and your customer base at that time is some number, then you'll need to buy two years, three years, five years. How long will it take you to get to IPv6? How much address space do you need to buy? And what do you think the price will be in two or three or five years? So you need to put that pricing chart in also. Uh, reducing costs, you can also, so this is one that's a bit challenging and you're gonna have to do some homework inside your company. So reducing that can make things simpler. Uh, but simplifying the network, both of these may be things where you have to go do some analysis. Look at how many outages you've had in the past six months because it was too, because it took a long, because things interacted in unpredictable ways. Or how many outages there were or how long it took to, to repair outages because uh, there were, uh, because it, it was complicated. If you can reduce the downtime, you can increase, you can reduce your costs. All right, you can also potentially sell addresses. Look at the price, how many could you sell? If you aren't gonna run out for 15 or 20 years, maybe you can sell some. A slash 16 is going for more than a million dollars. So that buys a lot of hardware. Now we're gonna talk about new services. Um, this is from Deutsche Telekom. They do, they do this cool thing in their TerraStream network. It's a experimental network. Uh, they, take, they assign a slash 56 to their user, and from that slash 56, they take a few bits and assign them to, dis, assign them to these different services. The first three are whether it's uh, public or private, infrastructure or user, and endpoint or service. And the second three, you can see they have a matrix down here to say whether it's a voice packet or a video packet or an internet packet. 
Can you imagine being able to apply policy based just on the IP address? That's pretty neat. If you can deploy a service that has special advantages because you can do this in hardware at line rate, then uh, you've got a potential new revenue source. All right, new capabilities coming, coming towards the end. Uh, there are several new capabilities that you might be able to do if you have IPv6. You have to decide, or you, you and your management have to decide whether these are important to you. Uh, of course, eliminating that, or at least reducing that, are, are potentially uh, good things. Uh, I'll talk about the rest of these. Oh, and the way to say this to your boss is, hey, at LACNIC, everybody was talking about these new technologies. Do you want to look into them, or do you want me to? Because sometimes the executive wants to, have, wants to spend some time and talk to their friends and see if it's uh, really an interesting topic. Uh, segment routing uh, v6 uses the extension headers to do something kind of like MPLS, where you can choose the path through the network. Uh, if you don't have an MPLS network or want to get rid of it, uh, this is a possibility. Uh, one warning is that uh, many routers can't do this at uh, hardware forwarding speed, so check with your vendor before you uh, decide you're gonna do this. Uh, this is one that I, that I made this up. So you've never seen this anyplace, it's not written down anywhere. This is, imagine you have a data center with a lot of servers in it. You probably do have a data center with a lot of servers. Uh, a connection comes in from a customer and it's assigned a process ID, right? A new process is, is spun up. You could take that process ID and put it into and make it part of the address so that if you assign a slash 64 to every other server in the data center, then you could send, uh, you could open connections from if the process ID here was face dude, uh, you could send it to some other prefix, face dude, and then be easily be able to correlate all of the connections throughout the data center to that one user process. And you could increment that and have trillions of possible uh, process IDs before uh, overwriting them. That means searching your logs for data, trying to troubleshoot what was going on uh, between different servers becomes much simpler because you just have this simple correlation. I think it's clever. There's a great video uh, on YouTube. I've provided the link here uh, by Matt Palmer. He shows that uh, you know, containerization is it's the way uh, a lot of data centers are, are moving. And when you're trying to, con to communicate between containers, it's annoying if you have NAT in each con for each container. It would be easier if you just had IPv6. Uh, he does a great job also towards the end. The first few minutes are normal IPv6 stuff you've heard before. The last several minutes are uh, things that are causing, causing him problems and why it's not perfect everywhere. So I, I love this video. If this is something that's interesting to you, go watch the video and, and see it, learn it. Okay, so the first thing you have to do in order to convince your executives is to uh, figure out whether your executive is managed, is, is motivated by risk or uh, competition or reducing costs or new capabilities, new revenue. And then you can focus your argument on what will be most motivating to her. You can say, uh, you're, you seem to be <laughs> losing sleep, let me talk about something else that's going to make you lose sleep unless we can get a handle on it. Uh, and so I've provided the, uh, of course, then you can go download the slides, update them with the links, and use any combination of them that works for you, that works uh, for making the argument to your boss. I have to say one more thing though, and that is dual stack, just deploying IPv6 doesn't get you a whole lot. It does get you the opportunity for, for lower latency, right? If you're going to an IPv6 enabled website, then you do use IPv6 and you get that benefit. And you do have uh, access, if there are any IPv6 only content, then you do have access to that. You don't get access to IPv6 only tools. and you, uh, you don't get the opportunity to sell addresses. You don't get the opportunity uh, for any of those new architectures. So don't just stop at dual stack. Think about how to go beyond dual stack to IPv6 plus IPv4 as a service in order to really take advantage of everything that you can do here to really benefit the business and therefore the community and, and the internet in your country. So I really want to hear from everybody what your plans are for IPv6. And that's part of why I included my email address, is I wanna know when you're deploying, 
what transition technology you're planning to use. If you have data for how big uh, networks are or how, they're, how fast they're growing, I would love to see that so I could uh, update those charts. If you have pricing data, uh, just send me all kinds of data. I'm really interested to, uh, to improve all of these metrics. And with that, I'd like to see, uh, are there any questions or comments? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Are we okay now? Yes. Yeah, my name is Tony Harris from Argentina Internet Association. Uh, I apologize, I had to step out of the last part of your presentation to fetch something, but I did have a question which I brought originally, and uh, <coughs> if you answered it, I'm sorry. But my question is, um, how do you envision, uh, w within the context of what you were presenting, and uh, the, w the way to convince management that IPv6 is a good idea. Um, do you see the intersection with Internet of Things uh, for IPv addresses being a factor in this or, or, or not? That, that's my question. Thank you. It, I think it depends on the architecture used by the thing. Um, and I think that's not a popular opinion. But many, inter many, many Internet things that I've seen are uh, don't even use IP, and therefore they go to some, some bridge uh, that therefore changes them to an IP address, and that uses IPv4 usually, or could use IPv6. So in those cases, I'm not sure that there is an important benefit. In other cases, I think that when you're talking about deploying thousands or millions of sensors or, or gadgets, then yeah, I think those are places where IPv6 might be important. And I think we have a couple of presentations later this week with probably, probably more information than I have. Thank you. Once again, I think I said some things that are pretty surprising. Doesn't anybody want to challenge them? <laughs> Well, maybe it's too early in the morning and it's uh, first, first thing on the first day of LACNIC. Okay, if nobody else has anything, thank you very much.